Beetlejuice! 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 I'm ready to party! He's an interdimensional demon who loves to eat bugs, scare the living, and hear people say his name. Beetlejuice? God, that's it! Name's Beetlejuice? Ah, you said it twice, just say it once more. Come on. That's right, we're talking about the ghost of the most, everyone's favorite low key perv, Beetlejuice. Hey, hey, hey! Excuse me? What? Such a scumbag. We're like the ghost with the most harassment lawsuits, am I right? It makes me want to kiss you guys. Come on. Come no, on. give me one. No, no, give me one. No, Thankfully, we're talking about the much more kid friendly version of Beetlejuice from the uber successful 1989 animated series on ABC. You know, the ghost with the most disgusting face? Not even close! Though, I like to remember him as the ghost with the most. Badass theme song. It's showtime! Damn right, it's showtime. This is everything you didn't know about Beetlejuice the cartoon. Beetlejuice the TV show was a huge hit on ABC Saturday morning lineup. It was innovative, satirical, and gleefully self aware. How'd you get in? How do you like that? 65 episodes and I never knew I had a back door. But really, it was good because it was nothing like the movie. The show creators took the core premise of the feature film and changed everything else. Except they kept Tiny Head Guy. I can't believe it. What has Beetlejuice done? No detail was too small to change. They moved the Dietzes to a new town called Peaceful Pines, changed the design of her parents, and gave Beetlejuice limitless powers, which he definitely put to good use. I want to go back and save Lydia, but I should run and hide. I'm of two minds. The TV show broke all the rules of adaptation by radically altering the source material, which is what made it so fresh. Like when Beetlejuice entered Lady's Doodles. <gasps> Babes! <laughs> Hi, BJ. Or when he refused to leave the end credits. A pony with oversized ears. No, no, no. A bat, that's it! A great big four-legged bat! No, wait, I can figure it out! But the biggest and best change was simply making Beetlejuice likable. The writers transformed him from a mean-spirited creep and scumbag into a high-energy goofball. He was pretty much the genie from Aladdin. It's great to have wheels. You'd be free as a bat! As cool as the abominable snow beast. Get my drift? Wait, hold up. The show came out three years before Aladdin. Did they get the idea of the genie from Beetlejuice? Think about it. The jokes, the powers, the costume changes, best friend is a human, there might be some... This is embarrassing. What's going on here? That's weird. Maybe it was Disney's revenge for the time Beetlejuice took shots at Disneyland in an episode called The Sappiest Place on Earth, where they completely destroyed Mickey Mouse, AKA Bartholomew Bat. Uh, Beach? Who's Bartholomew Bat? Just some loser from the old black and white cartoons. He is kind of a dud character to build an amusement park around, but hey, they have some great rides, Lids. Disney got the last laugh though when they bought ABC a few years later in 1996, which actually makes sense because this is the Disney live action musical remake we need right now. Be the world's main attraction. Be the world's biggest star. My gags will put you in jackson. He's gross, revolting, bizarre. Beetlejuice continued the trend of networks adapting popular live action movies into animated TV shows in the late 80s, early 90s. There were shows for Back to the Future, Police Academy, which was my jam, pretty much every Jim Carrey movie, and even the bad Godzilla movie starring Matthew Broderick. Remember that cartoon? The one where Godzilla looked nothing like Godzilla? The idea to adapt Beetlejuice into a TV show was a weird one. Not because Beetlejuice wasn't a hit, it was the 10th highest grossing movie of 1988, solidifying Tim Burton as a big time filmmaker, and it finally gave us a proper sequel to Dune. The weird part is, Beetlejuice the movie was even less kid friendly than Godzilla. Don't get me wrong, I love it, but it's dark and pretty disturbing. The Juice Man, which is what I call him, is a straight up villain and definitely guilty of at least two homicides. <laughs> which is why the cartoon had to change him into a shape-shifting side gag who will turn into anything for a laugh. 
even manure. A muck? Fabulous idea! You got a real fertile imagination, babe. Also, everybody in the movie hates Beetlejuice. Most of all, Lydia, with good reason since Beetlejuice forces her to marry him against her will. Do you, Lydia, take this man? No! To be no. Oh. She's a little bit nervous. The TV show changed that too by turning them into best buds. Beetlejuice helps Lydia with her real world problems, while Lydia teaches Beetlejuice how to be a better ghost dude and even fights for his immortal soul. Beetlejuice couldn't use his powers to save himself, but he could do it for a baby. Surely such an honorable ghoul deserves another chance. Yeah. 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 No one's ever fought for my immortal soul. Probably because I don't go to church. Lydia also went from being a mopey goth to a fearless explorer who embraced the weirdness of the netherworld and served as the show's moral compass. We can thank voice actor Alison Court for giving her such a strong voice. You dropped out? Beetlejuice, how could you have done something so dumb? Liz, this is me we're talking about. Can't you give him another chance? Court later went on to play Jubilee in X-Men the Animated Series. Time to blow this joint. And Claire Redfield in the Resident Evil games. I'm Claire. Claire Redfield. Overall, she helped sell Lydia's and Beetlejuice's relationship as super wholesome. Remember all the fun we had last year? The costumes, the singing, the dancing? The way I blew everyone away in the armpit contest. Oh, Beetlejuice, if we can't be together this summer, I'll scream! Scream anyway, babes! I like having that effect on people! But there were plenty of other important differences from the movie. In the TV show, Lydia doesn't need to say Beetlejuice's name three times. He can travel in and out of the afterlife at will. Though, she uses it to banish him away whenever he's getting way too annoying and way too punny. I am a skeleton. How much worse off can I get? <laughs> that jock. He goes to pieces over nothing. By the way, this show loved puns. There's actually a 30 minute supercut dedicated just to Beetlejuice puns. When I was a kid, I always cut class. Sometimes into little pieces. <laughs> and look how well I turned out. <laughs> also, they changed the name of the afterlife to the neither world because as mentioned, puns. Get it? Neither here nor there. Oh, and the main characters from the movie, Barbara and Adam, aka Madam President Gina Davis and old school Alec Baldwin, never appear in the TV show. God, you guys really are dead. But it's okay because they replaced them with a fun cast of silly neither world weirdos. Remember Jacques, the French skeleton who was a spoof of fitness guru Jack LaLanne and was constantly falling apart? You all need a workout. <laughs> Not again. Or how about the monster across the street? The monster is Beetlejuice's hairy neighbor who loves country music, has a dog named Poopsie, and really sucks at playing it cool. There's someone I want you to meet. Oh, you silly, go on. He also reminds me of Gossamer from Looney Tunes. Am I the only one? And of course, we can't forget Ginger, the tap dancing spider who would tap dance anywhere, even Claire's head. <laughs> then we have Beetlejuice's nemeses, Fuzzo and Scuzzle the Clowns, which are terrible names for party clowns. No one's hiring a clown named Scuzzo, unless it's free, and even then, probably not. Though he knew just how to butter up BJ. Attention fast food fans! Beetlejuice's restaurant is greasy, slimy, cruddy, and it stinks! All right! Free advertising. And lastly, there's everyone's favorite Neither World living car and Benny the Cab lookalike, Doomy. Doomy likes everyone except dogs and wax jobs. Come on, Doomy. I got the wax right here. It's justifiable. Most of the real world characters revolved around Lydia's parents and classmates, like her main rival, Claire Brewster. She's an uptight rich kid who really hates Lydia's drawing style. Of course, if you have any ideas, why, sure. I have a totally awesome idea. I don't need you or your disgusting doodles. She was voiced by Tara Strong, who was initially cast as Lydia, but was swapped out at the last second. Strong later became a prominent voice actor best known for Timmy Turner from Fairly Odd Parents and Twilight Sparkle on My Little Pony. In order to help Lydia fight Claire, Beetlejuice would appear in the real world as his female alter ego, Betty Juice which is a huge improvement over his sumo wrestler alter ego. 
What better way to make strong women out of them? Subarashi! Hey! Well, all right, Beetlejuice. Uh, Betty. He had a lot of alter egos, actually. There was Mr. Beetleman, Beetle Bones, and of course, nicknamed we both share, General Splatten. So he wants to play rough. Tell it to General Splatten. Onion Ted Dunk! But my favorite was Snuggle Juice. Look no further, little goose, for I am here, your Snuggle Juice. All right, Beetlejuice. At school, Lydia's best friends were Prudence and Bertha, who Beetlejuice refers to as Prune and Bert. So yeah, he still had some of that rude movie version left in him. Though, they totally get their revenge. Thanks to his strong cast of characters and lively humor, Beetlejuice had a long run on network TV, running for four seasons, 94 episodes in total, and culminating in a massive 65 episode fourth and final season. Us kids loved Beetlejuice. Bad B.O. and all. <gasps> on with your shoes! On with your shoes! The demand for Beetlejuice was so strong that ABC sold the reruns to Fox. That's right, Beetlejuice aired simultaneously on competing networks, with new episodes appearing on the weekends for ABC and reruns headlining Fox Kids Weekday Afternoon Block. Call your neighbors, call your friends, tell them to watch my show on Fox! This was a huge accomplishment for a kids show this dark. My poor parents! Oh, it's all my fault. We should never have tricked them into coming on the vacation. Or for a kids show with R-rated jokes. You're gonna get in big trouble, and I'm gonna watch! <laughs> And I'm gonna tell your mother too! But that's what made Beetlejuice so great. It was edgy and unpredictable. And the critics agreed. In 1990, Beetlejuice won a daytime Emmy for outstanding children's programming. Though technically it was a tie with The New Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Which makes no sense that this... Tied with this. Ah! What do you mean you don't want to move back? But we can't talk about how awesome this show is without mentioning Danny Elfman's music. Elfman lent the show his original score from the movie and also provided new music like this. Even the armpit solo is a banger. But most of all, Beetlejuice will be remembered for its innovative approach to animation. They were the first animated TV show to use CGI regularly, which appeared in all of the Bury Me Not commercials. Then test your skills at BJ's Driving School, where we'll give you the inside track on those post-pedestrian problems. They were great, even though sometimes seemed a little shoehorned in. I've heard of a trail getting cold, but this is ridiculous. Trail gotten cold? Haven't got a clue? Well, then try Bury Me Not's Clues for the Clueless. And that's because Tim Burton wanted it that way. Burton served as the executive producer of the TV show and wanted the show to experiment with different forms of animation, like he did in his earlier short films like 1982's Vincent. For a boy his age, he's considered it a nice. But he wants to be just like Vincent Price. Oh, and if Vincent seems super familiar to you Beetlejuice fans, that's because he reappears as the glum ruler of the netherworld, Prince Vincent. But don't worry, he's just as emo here. I am but a dark cloud on her horizon. Stop motion ended up being way too expensive, so they abandoned it for CGI, which is just as expensive. But thanks to Burton's encouragement, Beetlejuice pushed the boundaries of animation in other ways. They had Beetlejuice enter a parallel dimension of surrealism. Beetlejuice, what's happening to you? Come on, Liz. Don't be such a square. I'm not a square. Huh? Right. You're a cubist. And he also entered the pages of his favorite comic books. The Turkish Daddy! Slinky costumes. You know I love them. Like the animation itself, the stories were just as edgy. While the earlier seasons focused on Lydia and Beetlejuice struggling with everyday problems like annoying roommates, clueless parents, and school elections, the later seasons became more satirical and experimental, which resulted in a lot of strange but cool episodes, like when Beetlejuice clothes himself and immediately gets into a pun war. Please, you guys, lighten up! Lighten up? Nobody's lighter or brighter than me. I got a flash for you, buddy. Oh, yeah! Oh, 
They also love doing spoofs off popular movies, like the episode Wizard of Ooze. Uh, the wizard's gonna get me a mess of courage! And what? I am getting my off back! And he's giving me a piece of his mind! I just wanna go home! They also spoof TV shows like The Twilight Zone with the episode The Chromosome, where Rod Serling pretty much sums up Beetlejuice perfectly. Submitted for your approval, a Mr. Beetlejuice. Self-proclaimed ghost with the most. But in reality, just another befuddled honors graduate from the School of Hard Knocks. And when they finally ran out of TV and movies to parody, they weren't afraid to dive into other subjects like classic literature. Like when they did a whole episode about Shakespeare and finally revealed where Shakespeare got all his ideas from. Untitled Shakespeare Project. Every time I try to write verse, my mind goes blank. Maybe Francis Bacon really did write all my plays. Or when they made fun of Edgar Allan Poe in Potpourri. This was one of my favorites, as Beetlejuice enters some of Poe's most famous poems in order to help him find his long lost love, Lenore, whose design was actually based on Winona Ryder. I told you I'd meet you at the ramp on the bridge. Oh. Holy crap, that dude's forehead is huge. They also revisited history in Your History and caused a huge fight between George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. How come your picture's on a $1 bill and Lincoln is on a five? Does that mean he's five times more valuable than you? Hmm. I think it does. Sars not, fuzz fuzz. How'd you like me to loosen those wooden teeth of yours? Well, how would you like me to punch that wart back into your face? They were making fun of history before it became a staple of Kiss TV shows a few years later in shows like Animaniacs, Tiny Toons, and Hysteria. Their commentary was ahead of the curve, like when they made fun of the commercialization of superheroes in Super Zeros. When those doors open, the fans will flood in to buy multiple copies of my comic book adventures. Not only will I be glorified, I'll be filthy stinking rich, as opposed to just being filthy and stinking. <laughs> Ironic? considering Tim Burton had just directed Batman. Also, that episode featured a one-off guest appearance by George Lowe, who later went on to voice Space Ghost. What were we supposed to do? You know what the maintenance bills on this satellite are like? We needed work. Oh, I see what you're doing. Love Space Ghost. But the best Beetlejuice episodes were the self-aware ones. Like when Beetlejuice becomes a heartless TV executive at a fake network called TNN and gets all of his ideas by stealing them from workers in the mill room. He's turning into a network monster. Don't bother me with that stuff. You're fired. Do you hear me? Fired. You'll never work in this town again. TNN later became a real network, by the way. I watched a ton of BCW wrestling on there. Anyway, uh, the writers behind Beetlejuice were successfully pushing the boundaries of kids' TV. That's because there were some serious heavyweights fighting the scourge of writer's block. There was Patty Cameron, who was the story editor on DuckTales. Woo! Also, Ted Anasty, the story editor on The Smurfs. And there was story editor Eric Lewald, who would later go on to develop X-Men the Animated Series. Probably in the same way Beetlejuice developed his own origin story. These origins rubbed me the wrong way. I can come up with a much more original, thoroughly cool, and improbable superhero type origin of my own! But the writers didn't come up with all the stories themselves. The fans helped too. One of their ideas came from a teenager in Maine who wrote a letter to the producers pitching an episode where Lydia forms a punk band called The Brides of Funkenstein. And they actually bought it for 250 bucks. Where do I sign? <laughs> Thanks to its lovable characters and creative adaptations, Beetlejuice totally holds up today. And is definitely one of the best shows produced by Canadian animation studio Nelvana, who also produced Inspector Gadget and Clone High, but also Star Wars Ewoks. We are the e Oh yeah, Beetlejuice was definitely a high point in 90s cartoons. What does it rank on your list? Better yet, what was your favorite Beetlejuice alter ego? Mine is Genie from Aladdin. Tell us what you think in the comments. Yeah, we got him. We got him. Oh, cut the camera. Cut. What's cut. going If you guys like that episode, uh, make sure you subscribe. New episodes come out every other week, and you can check out old episodes, too. And Genie was totally its own original idea. They didn't take it from Beetlejuice.